you know uh, some ten some ten minutes before uh, the end of the session, we'll just discuss some of the important questions. Also, first of all, to just you know uh, give you some ideas with regard to the examination, since it is the last uh, class for this uh, paper for this year for this academic year and for this paper. I thought I'll just tell you, you know. Like you have five units in this paper, and uh, you will definitely have equal number of questions from all the five units. Since you are PG students, you must be knowing about all these things. But still, you know, I thought I'll just uh, emphasize on this point that uh, for hundred marks, if you are having uh, some uh, five long answers. And the remaining marks going for short answers, say uh, eight marks. Okay, uh, eight into five for short answers, forty. And the remaining, you know, will be for the long answers. Okay, so just have it as essay type answers and short question answers. Okay, short uh, paragraph question answers. Okay, so in that case, equal number of questions will be asked from all the five units. So please remember this. and uh, you know prepare for your exams accordingly that is one thing i wanted to tell you and uh, now uh, as i told you in this paper although the paper started all the the paper started with uh, you know part 1 explaining about mass communication we were more in, uh, bothered about journalism the print media okay we were more bothered about the print media about news in print though news comes on television though it is bro broadcasted through the web etc etc we were more bothered about the news in print media so we were looking at the different uh, aspects of uh, this journalism and uh, unit 1 was explaining to us what is news how news is gathered what are the sources of uh, news and how news lead is written so what is a news lead who are the suppliers so that will definitely be one question the suppliers of news okay the foreign so foreign uh, agencies as well as national agencies so the press trust of india united uh, uh, what is that Uh, it, it is all given you know on, uh, in the last part of the unit 1 okay press trust of india united news of india hindustan sha samachar etc okay so what i wish to say is from unit 1 you will have uh, around two essay questions from this uh, with the, either with internal choice i think it should be internal choice or you know even um, um, all all the five units containing questions with some choices okay so you will be asked what a news lead is and what are the characteristic features of that and unit 2 on reporters and who all form the team of uh, report writing for the newspaper so you have the reporters sub editors uh, news editors the editors and how news is covered how they get the pictures for the news various features of uh, the people involved in preparation of news okay and unit 3 we saw what a column is what an editorial page is and what editing is who are all involved in this editing how editorials are written things like that okay that comprised uh, unit 3 and then we had unit 4 where we were looking at the importance of writing good headlines importance of the makeup of the paper newspaper presentation of the paper design of the paper the language its style and uh, editing of the picture captions etc so we have to take immense care while writing the captions for pictures and uh, who are involved in picture editing and what should be the quality of pictures etc etc so now coming to unit 5 which is advertising which is advertising um uh, here uh, we are going to look into two things advertising copy reading and proof reading for uh, accuracy without uh, copy editing copy reading proof reading the paper cannot achieve its final touches okay so it has to be proofread 
in order to be uh, error free so importance given to these aspects now coming to advertising uh, what role does this advertising play what role does it play in this print media okay and uh, to start with uh, this particular book has uh, given you know detailed uh, uh, description about adverse advertising its features its functions and uh, who has to do this advertising job who does this etc etc and uh, we see that this advertising so what is advertising what is advertisement okay uh, the chapter the unit begins with a simple definition of what advertising means why it should be uh, why why should people go for advertising so we see why at all should uh, you know producers people who produce things go for advertisement so because they need to do marketing in order to sell their products okay main purpose of adver- advertising is to sell their products to make their products known to the public and uh, mainly to earn money to earn more profit okay so this marketing so advertising is any form of non personal presentation okay you don't have any kind of personal presentation in advertising it is non personal presentation and promotion of ideas goods and services etc etc okay mainly promoting ideas promoting goods and services promoting the products thereby making people buy your product so that is why things are advertised advertisement is advertisement's main purpose is to make something known to the public to a larger audience make something known to the larger audience so advertising is very very non personal and it is directed and addressed to a large number of anonymous people uh, the advertiser may not know to whom he is talking to whom he is sending a message about his product so he is talking to people whom he does not know to anonymous people okay so he is addressing uh, a large group of people so advertisements can be done by direct mail also uh, addressing it to a specific person and it will be prepared by a computer by a machine and uh, advertising typically is paid for okay somebody pays to bring out their advertisements in order to take products to the mass so who advertises usually um sponsors sponsors non profit organizations profitable organizations who want their products to be known to the public only will advertise okay so we have paid for services paid for advertisements and uh, some non profit organizations like the red cross uh, united way etc do not pay for any advertisements brought out uh, so uh, when people are uh, interested in advertising uh, they should be having the time and space okay time and space uh, so these non profit organizations they do not pay for the time or space for the advertisements uh, it is only uh, the business organizations who are inter- interested in taking their product further to the public are interested in advertising okay so um, you have this direct mail advertising and then paid for services and then non profit organizations and then political adver- advertising political advertising okay so here in political advertising the identity of the advertiser may not be self evident okay uh, it, it may not be self evident now coming to the functions of advertising you have four basic functions of advertising so as i already told you advertising is mainly uh, made for marketing it has the function of marketing Uh, the provider of the products or services must sell their products so that is why thing uh, they advertise they must the advertisement is mainly done for selling sales promotions advertising work um 
work in order to uh, bring about their product to the market in a great way okay and uh, the first function if it is marketing means the second function is educational making people learn about new products or services that are there in the market okay so making people educational in the sense making people come to know about new products and sales and then advertisement plays an economic role thirdly it is economic role so what is this economic role so the ability to advertise allows new competitors to come into business so competition so if there are number of competitors for one particular product then it will encourage product improvement and when uh, too many products come into market then it will lead to lower prices also it will lead a lead to a decrease in the prices also so advertising uh, through all these functions aims at uh, reaching people okay so the first function was uh, marketing that is to sell their products and the second was to uh, make people educational learn about new products and services third one economic allowing competitors to enter the business arena and fourth one is the social function so displaying very clearly the material and cultural opportunities available in the free enterprise society okay so advertising not only increases productivity but also raises the standard of living so that is why uh, advertising is uh, exists in society okay advertising exists in society because of these four functions now coming to types of advertising advertising can be classified in several ways one is to one is to distinguish the target audience the specific segment of the population for whom the product or service has definite appeal okay so why uh, the the product that has come to the market should have a definite appeal okay so mostly consumers and business people they are interested in uh, coming out with ad- advertisements whatever product they come out with should be made known to the people so what they say is there are uh, different uh, ways of classifying these advertisements one is where uh, one is where consumers and business people are involved and then you have another kind called business to business advertising see uh, the first form of advertising is in order to attract a large number of consumers uh producers advertise okay producers advertise in order to attract large number of consumers this business to business advertising is uh business people in order to attract uh, some other business people they advertise okay so you have consumer advertising business to business advertising for example what is this business to business advertising we'll see uh in detail later it is nothing but uh the different uh, professional people be it agriculturalists or traders or industrialists advertising in order to attract other business people okay and then the next third focus will be on geographic focus so what is this geographic focus uh international advertising okay some products like coca cola pepsi and all is used all over the globe okay so uh here even this mcdonald's product okay so here this advertisement is given in a number of countries uh, around the globe so that is geographic focus geographic focus can be international advertising as well as national advertising national advertising where the ent- advertising is made in the different regions of the country same country international ad- advertising is uh different countries advertising made in the different countries whereas national advertising is made in the different regions of the same country so you have international advertisers national advertisers and then local or regional advertisers local or regional advertisers so uh you know 
why should we advertise in order to increase the number of buyers so for international products international advertising is made for national products national advertising is made suppose a service is given available only in a particular region only in the local area then advertisement is made in the local channels local newspapers etc so according to the need according to the demand uh, advertisements are made okay so for example oil companies and all you know uh, which which are being run in at the international level then they will be involved in international advertising so coming to this uh, uh, you know disti- distinguishing okay so you have two kinds of demands categorizing categorizing advertising through for which the purpose it is used the uh, based on the purpose for which advertising is used we categorize them into primary demand and selective demand okay so what is this primary demand and selective demand primary demand advertisement has as its purpose the promotion of a particular product okay particular product suppose uh, what is this particular product and specific product see primary demand gives advertisement for a particular product it concentrates on the product suppose uh, there is an advertisement which says uh, everybody should uh, you know uh, at the, uh, everybody should uh, drink milk every day so it is for the product it is for the milk okay so it is for the product that is primary demand suppose it is selective demand ad means the ad would be given for a certain brand suppose we said uh, in pondicherry we have this ponle and then you know the um, what is that uh, the, the other brands okay i don't know a number of brands are available so you have uh, if the advertisement is for a particular brand for one certain brand then it is called as selective brand suppose it is for the product as such for milk as such then it is for a then it is called as primary demand so now you must be knowing the difference between primary demand and selective demand okay so um, ads can also be classified as direct action and indirect action so what is this direct action direct uh, direct action usually direct action advertisements usually will have all these details given in the advertisement okay so what are the details the number through which they can contact the toll free number then the coupon email address etc so that we can um, see the details of the advertiser okay so the contact details direct action advertisement so what is this indirect action advertisement so here we have a company's image and increase uh, the, this advertisement indirect action advertisement is uh, given in order to increase the popularity of the product for the long run okay uh, so here in order to build a company's image and increase the consumer's awareness this particular advertisement is made so overall we see that advertisement is part of the marketing process okay so mar- marketing means what uh, con- uh, marketing is involved for what for products for the development of a product for the pricing for its distribution for promoting ideas goods and services okay so advertisement is part of a general promotion process along with personal selling along with sales promotions public relations um it also concentrates on the general promotion process so here a brief history of uh, advertising is given to us a very brief history of advertising is given to us how advertising started actually okay so they say it is very impossible for us to pinpoint exactly you know and go to the date where advertising advertisements originated so initially in order to advertise clay tablets were used it seems okay clay clay tablets where uh, messages were uh, given on the clay tablet 
uh, with regard to some uh, product uh, here it is said it was you know initially adopted by, by an ointment dealer and a shoemaker clay tablets where uh, you know letters are inscribed inscribed on a clay and you know uh, kept in various places and then the town crier uh, the, the the person who is involved in you know spreading messages through throughout the town okay the town crier and then with the in, uh, invention of printing machines gutenberg's invention of printing machine uh, advertisement slowly started uh, gaining momentum and uh, like posters handbills newspaper ads etc etc so the first handbill was produced in 1418 80 that announced a prayer book for sale okay so like that they are, they have given you, you know uh, um, at length how this advertisement started okay so they have given a history of advertising so they also say that with the industrial revolution uh, a number of classified ads started coming major changes in society started taking place and uh, advertising started gaining momentum okay so the impact of increasing in industrialization was apparent at, at, at the end of the civil war which took place in 1865 they say so um, it it is all you know uh, given in detail and they also say the main uh, main thing that boosted up advertisements is the uh, industrial revolution economic production even the uh, bringing about of railroads etc so all these things the economic and communication climate all these things made advertisements thrive okay and uh, increase the importance of advertising then um, at a later period you know with after the during the modern uh, period uh, they saw how advertisements especially you know with the world war 2 with the end of the world war 2 and all during world wars 1 and 2 advertisements took a setback okay because uh, why did it say take a setback because it involved a lot of money. So people were in the mood of fear and apprehension. So uh, economic prosperity found a setback. And um, people were so scared about everything, especially with the Korean War and all. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, people, uh, start, people became skeptical about uh, advertisements also because it, uh, they believed that it was brainwashing kind. Okay. So advertisement uh, during the Kore after this Korean War period and all, it was uh, indicted as a fine uh, form of mind control that seduced people. Okay, so they believed advertisements seduced people, and uh, it resulted in destructive things. Also, uh, advertisers used psychological research and motivational analysis. How advertisements motivated people to buy things. So, uh, kind of negative uh, impact was there during the war period and all. And slowly, it's, it started coming back. And people also refused to, you know, people were also against uh, advertisements that were made for tobacco, liquor sale, etc., etc. So, people were not for that. And a new, um, see, so far... We have we are not concentrating only on the advertisements that are there on the print media. We are also bothered about uh, advertisements that occur in all the media. So another advertising and marketing medium was the internet that uh, came during the 1990s. And the internet, so every company which wanted to advertise had a website, print, television ads, etc., etc., and you see every organization every company will be having um, will be having uh, a separate uh, advertising agency also okay so um, we see that there are uh, three main components for advertising industry advertisers the people who are involved in advertising are called the advertisers advertising agencies and then the media to 
advertise okay so advertising so what is this we already saw that it is the overall marketing plan how to make people buy their products okay so at the very basic level there are two different types national advertising and retail advertising what is this national advertising national advertisers sell their products or services to customers all over the country all across the country okay so national advertisers they are not bothered about the local uh, place the local place where that particular product or service is sold for example this coca cola company they don't advertise for one particular shop in a local or region uh, but they are bothered about giving advertisement at the national level okay so that is national advertising so what is this retail advertising retail advertising is for the local advertisers local merchants for a uh, this is made retail advertisements is made to attract customers from a specific store from a specific place of business so uh, you cannot uh, you know some some advertisers are entirely national advertising agencies some advertisers are entirely retail but there are people there are companies which have a mix of both these national and local advertisers uh franchises uh, fr franchises for example mcdonalds and uh, you know the coffee uh, coffee day or coffee shop i mean it's coffee day isn't it so these people you know take up advertisements at a national level so we see that every organization every company will have their own advertising departments okay so what is the duty of these advertising departments it is mainly marketing only marketing all advertisers whether they are large or small must attend to several basic functions if they are involved in producing advertisements so what what are these functions that these advertisers are involved in they are involved in planning the advertisements planning the ads and then deciding where they will appear and the third one is budget the amount of money that is going to go into bringing about the advertisement so planning and deciding where they are going to appear and then advertising uh, the amount of money that will go into the advertisement and of course without proper coordination of all these things uh, it will not come out well so coordinating the advertising with other departments in the organization and supervising the work of an outside agency suppose a company has um, uh is plan the company is doing it with the help of another organization an, an outside agency then it has to supervise that uh, agency or company's work how it is uh, involved in production of the ad so we see that uh, some large uh, advertisements advertisers have departments itself separate departments itself advertising department to purchase the space and air time for the ads see most importantly uh, the people who are interested in uh, giving advertisements they need to have space and time space and time so we see that uh, these uh, small companies or organizations purchase by time and space by time and space for bringing out their advertisements and we also see that any advertising agency should be creative people they should be creative people and they should be business people who develop prepare and place advertising for sellers seeking to find customers for their goods and services and we see that uh, when it comes to the business of advertising it is only big cities that earn a lot of money okay so based on the range of services that these advertising agencies provide we can classify them into three main types full service agencies number one is full service agencies and then media buying services and then creative boutiques 
So what is this full service agencies? As the very name indicates, as the very name a full service agency implies, we see that um, uh, this particular uh, agency's uh, job is to plan, do everything, do, do the entire service. The advertising process products clients are complete. Okay, they take up everything, full service. So that is what the name implies. So they take up planning the advertisement, creating, being creative, and uh, producing and placing ads. Okay. So in order to, in, in addition to all these, they also provide other marketing services like uh, promoting the sales, exhibiting, exhibiting the products, trade show exhibits, and then preparation of newsletters, annual reports, etc., etc. So um, full service means what? Their clients need not seek the help of any other company for promoting their product. So the entire promotion of the product will depend on this one agency, which is called as full service agency. Okay. So that is number one. And then what is this media buying service? So this media buying service specializes in buying radio and television time. Okay. So the space and time that is allotted in radios, televisions, that this media buying service specializes in buying them and they will resell it to the advertisers and advertising agencies. So the service, the, the job of this media buying service is to uh, sell uh, is to sell to the advertiser, orders the spots on the various stations and monitors the stations also and looks at uh, monitors. Monitors in the sense, they see to it that the ad is properly carried out on time. Okay. And then what is this third method? A creative boutique. boutique. So here this term boutique was coined in uh, the year 1960s and we see that this creative boutique is an organization that specializes in the actual creation of ads. Okay, they are very creative when uh, uh, making the ads, when bringing out the ads. They are very imaginative and very distinctive advertising themes are brought in, very uh, innovative and uh, very original. So um, a company that uses this type, this creative boutique, would have to employ another agency to perform planning, buying, administrative functions, etc. Okay. See, the full service agency does everything. Media buying service buys time and space from radios and televisions and resells it to advertisers and advertising agencies. Whereas Creative Botic uh, designs the ad in a very creative manner, but then uh, they use the help of another agency for planning, buying, and ad administrative purposes. Okay. Mm. So it is uh, uh, these uh, full service agencies, they, you know, because they are involved in everything, they uh, see this, uh, the remaining two types, media buying services and uh, creative boutique type. They, the full service agency sees the rest of the two as their competitors only. Okay, because uh, since they are involved in full service doing everything, they look at the rest of the two as their competitors. So what does this full service ad do for a client? Okay, so they initially study the product or the service that is provided and then they try to determine the marketable characteristic features uh, what are the potentials for good market and then they distribute the plants and also advertise in the media. Okay. So the last part of advertising in industry consists of the mass media. So we see that the media serves as a connection between the company and its customers. So the company is involved in producing. The company is involved in production and the product product the finished product should reach the customers. So who have who has to take the product to the customers? Either the company has to take special efforts or the job lies with 
uh, the uh, the advertising agencies, the advertising industry. So the company produces a product. The product has to be taken to the customers, sold to the customers. So this um, uh, this thing, you know, the connection between the company and the customers is made by the advertising agency through the media. Okay. So the advertisements are normally done through TV, newspapers, magazines, internets, etc., etc. So um, employers have to, advertisers have to adopt, advertisers have to employ highly skilled media planners to help them place and schedule their ads. So advertising specialists evaluate media along four dimensions. So what are the four dimensions? One is good reach. How many people can get the message that is passed on through the advertisements, the reach. And then the frequency. How often will the message be received? So the frequency. And then the selectivity. Which medium we'll have to select. That's the medium actually reach the potential customers. And then efficiency. How efficiently it has carried uh, how much does it cost to reach a certain number of people? So these four things will have to be borne in mind while evaluating media. The reach, frequency, selectivity and efficiency. And uh, nowadays uh, advertising online is also popular. So online advertising began in 1994 when Hotwired, the digital counterpart at TechnoHip Wired magazine started a website with a dozen sponsors. Okay. So, um, a whole new industry has grown up consisting of companies that uh, create ads and sell ads. And uh, the success of uh, online advertising depended on how many people see it, how many people open the advertisements and watch it. Okay, so internet companies had fu fueled the growth of web advertising. Uh, and uh, the surge in the number of advertising agencies by the internet companies that also increased the uh, revenue for the traditional media. So even uh, online advertising was successful. Internet was used as a medium and uh, many companies started understanding the maximum potential that the internet ads were holding. Okay. So... Um, there were, there, were, there were a number of companies also, you know, digital companies. Uh, there were a number of companies which uh, brought out the city websites, okay? So, which brought out these online websites only for the purpose of advertising. So, online banners were there. So, online banners and all, it only depended on how many people actually clicked on the banner and uh, you know, uh, were interested in those advertisements. So they have given some categories of internet uh, advertising also. So you have this uh, banner advertising, uh, banner ads, which is the most common in uh, internet advertising. So here the, uh, these banners, you know, appeared in the top and bottom and even on the sides of a web page and it was scattered throughout the content. And uh, each uh, banner, each uh, banner ad, you know, displayed each ad, each banner displayed a company logo, a very catchy phrase that will immediately catch the attract, uh, attract the attention of the visitor, visitor of the site. The visitor who clicks on to these sites are provided with more information about the product, etc., etc. Okay. So, in addition to this uh, banner ads which is one category of internet advertising. We have another one where advertisers can sponsor chat rooms. Okay, chat rooms which are related to their product. So, for example, a travel agency. So, that might sponsor a room that is devoted to travelers' experiences. And then advertisers also use direct email campaigning. Okay, sending advertisements through emails. So this form of advertisement was also highly efficient, but there were also risks. Uh, risk, uh, it was also risky that uh, many consumers might uh, consider this 
content as spam and might also react negatively that thing is also possible okay and there were websites devoted to a product or company or another form of web advertising okay so exclusive uh, websites exclusively meant for advertisement purposes alone now there is another area in this advertisement that is producing advertisements so many big companies have their own advertising departments so almost like agencies okay so what do these agencies have so there are four uh, major departments in these advertising agencies um four types of services actually creative services account services marketing services and administration so as the very name goes creative services are interested in creatively uh, designing the advertisement and you know bringing out the final advertising copy like their headlines messages etc etc and accounts of course uh, is responsible for the relationship between the agency and the client and the marketing services which is involved in taking up the product to the consumers and of course administration which administrates the entire process so this uh, administration is in charge of office management clerical functions accounting personal training of new employees etc so uh, there is also the advertising campaigning so this campaign consists of a large number of advertisements all these emphasizing the same major theme or the appeal that it will carry so the you have some six phases of a typical campaign one is choosing the marketing strategy what strategy should be employed in order to make the advertisement successful and then selecting the main appeal what will appeal to the general public and translating that theme into various media and producing different advertisements and also buying space and time then carrying out executing and evaluating the campaign so very detailed explanations are given in the textbook as to how these things are carried out now next coming to advertising research why should agencies carry out research in this area so advertising research takes place during all phases of the campaign and helps agencies and their clients to make informed decisions about the strategy that they have employed and about the tactics so research is very very important okay and uh, what is agency comp compensation how advertising agency makes money so what is this agency comp compensation why should an agency be interested in propagating a product in which to which they are no way related why should they uh, uh, you know be interested in bringing out bringing out an uh, advertisement for some company's product so uh, it is mainly because they can make money they can make money and uh, it is generally said that uh, we will not come to know how, uh, how these ad advertising agency will make money it, they say that it is not known outside the agency only the inmates of the agency will know how much money agencies are making okay so how much money the media community and the advertising agencies make through these advertisements nobody will know they tell okay so three common methods are there media commissions agency charges and fees so you know each organization each advertising agency will fix a certain amount of commission in order to propagate the product so they will be paid okay these are all paid services only some percentage of commission say 15 percentage uh, for creativity and 15 percentage of the total uh, uh, revenue that make 
that they make out of that advertisement so it goes on like that but however recently they say that this commission system has been declining in property some companies pay agencies a fixed fee it seems okay instead of uh, you know going by way of percentage they pay some fixed fee okay and some payments are made on based uh, are made to some payments are made based on the sales okay so it goes on like that and then uh, this business to business advertising okay so what is this business to business advertising it is designed to sell products and services not to individuals not to general consumers but to other businesses as we discussed earlier okay so there are four main categories of business to business advertising one is trade another one is industrial next comes professional next comes agricultural so what is this trade advertising goods and services to wholesalers and retailers then industrial advertising that are uh, used for machines coffee machines forklifts drill presses etc production of goods and services that are used for production of goods and services for professionals professionals like doctors loyal lawyers architects nurses etc agricultural advertisements aimed at farmers so this is business to business advertising and then you have something called as consumer versus business to business advertising so media is also involved in this and uh, how you can create uh, an appeal uh, in the business to business advertisement all these are given in detail here now the most important is so far we have been discussing uh, in general how these advertisements are carried out in all the medias okay so now coming to particularly advertisements in newspapers so this advertising in newspapers how newspapers are entirely dependent on newspapers in order to increase their revenue so uh, we see that the fir nation's first newspaper advertisement came in the boston news letters in the first issue in 1704 okay again you have the history of how advertisements started in newspapers and what is its growth etc etc so when it came in the print media when it came on newspapers they even got complaints from the customers okay suppose medicines were advertised they say this is perfect for headache body ache etc and it suppose it doesn't work and it gives some side effects negative side effects then what happens the um, followers of the advertisements they started writing complaint letter to the newspapers okay so because of that later on came certain rules and regulations so what advertisements to carry on in the papers and what advertisements not to carry because advertising shouldn't become an embarrassment it will ultimately mar the reputation of the newspaper so newspapers have to take immense care in uh you know uh, telling uh, in 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 printing advertisements which will have negative effect and then they are talking about advertisements in magazines on radio television etc etc so advertising in general share some characteristic features so what are these characteristic features three in main okay so one is repetition so uh, one is repetition another one is advertising style third one is ubiquity so what is this repetition advertisements uh, carry more weightage when things are getting repeated when a simple phrase or a simple message gets repeatedly been told or printed then it has a special effect widespread okay it will help in uh, getting widespread the message will easily reach if it has this repetitive effect on the consumers and then the style you know it is always better earlier uh, during earlier times advertisements adopted a plain direct style okay but later on what happened uh, advertisers begin to 
began to adopt a style of hyperbole using high five words uh, which will not be to the reach of the common people so hyperbole and uh, making large claim for the products for example usually it will be told no like the advertisement that comes for fair and lovely within 7 weeks you will be uh, fair and lovely they say but then uh, it was very jovious uh, joviously commented no jovially commented by some group of people who said uh, i mean i've been using it for 20 years 30 years i never became fair so that is a kind of claim that is made for the product so tall talks tall talks instead of plain talk tall talks hyperboles large claims were made for the products so uh, then you have this uh, ubiquity what is this ubiquity ubiquity means present everywhere so everywhere advertisements are placed you know wherever the consumers attention can be caught uh, in such places the advertisements were placed so this also contributed to the uh, easy reach of the product but sometimes uh, it works to the advertising's disadvantage also and then uh, to grab your attention uh, advertisements uh, should effectively work on they say so they have given some 15 uh, methods in which advertisements can act as an appeal to the consumers so in that 15 uh, needs it is said that need for sex you know it is a biological need where if it is um, expressed in the advertisement that there will be a easy attraction for the consumers and the need for affiliation so uh, in cases of friendship family ties etc there will be some advertisements which catch uh, which tries to capture the attention of the reader or the watcher through this need for affili- affiliation and then need for nurturing so this they say that this product will be good for your children for your uh, pet animals so you know their maternal or paternal instincts are aroused and then need for guidance need to aggress and need to achieve dominate prominence attention autonomy escape etc etc so you you can just read this it is uh, explained also against each and every point and uh, there is a topic which says finding the audience so to which audience you need to advertise who are the audience to whom you should appeal which demographic are you so to this we see that the advertisers should be careful about their target audience who should be their audience for whom is the advertisement designed so the they should be uh, you know taking immense care about the demographics of the audience so who should be the target audience uh, whether they are male or female what their age is income level marital status geographic location etc etc so uh, means he the advertiser should have a thorough knowledge of the audience to which he is trying to make a reach because he has to design his advertisement in such a way okay then they say there are uh, three points of criticism in uh, telling what's wrong with advertisement so why uh, why shouldn't advertisements be made what is wrong with that so they say advertising apart from you know Uh, adding competitors bringing out numerous products into the market also adds to the cost of the products advertisements advertising adds to the cost of the products so critics you know they criticize this so even the manufacturing of a product and uh, finally taking to taking it to the consumers everything gets increased and uh, sometimes because of the advertisements people start buying products which they do not need also they say and um, it reduces competition some critics say like that okay so they have given detailed explanation of what all these things mean and uh, how you have to uh, attain success in uh, 
you know making your advertisements reach a large public so here again like uh, it is in editing uh, like it is in uh, bringing out uh, perfect headline perfect lead here also working in advertising also mean that you have to have a very creative approach you should um, have the researching abilities and good public relationships okay so that is what will uh, bring about successful um, advertisements and how the internet print print internet print and then radio etc bring about advertisements and they also say that certain advertisements like for liquor for uh, tobacco and all should not be made also and uh, towards the end we should uh, we see what this copy reading and proof reading also so like uh, you know writing news like writing headlines while writing lead you you have to be careful about uh, bringing out these uh, advertisements also designing of advertisement you have to carefully proof read it for accuracy etc okay so as i told you in the beginning of the session you have to be very careful and from the exam point of view you will be having questions from all the unit for both short answers and long answer hence it is not advisable to omit any of the units okay yeah there are no questions but then you have uh, uh, on the introduction page no index page before page 1 you have a pap uh, paper where uh, each of the divisions are given you can take clues from that okay see each of the unit consists of some four parts except for last unit which has only two parts the remaining are all having four parts which shows the importance of each sub topic you have to claim uh, you, you have to take the clue from that okay anything else please can we wind up this class all the best for your exams do well the book is quite easy only if you give a proper reading then you will naturally understand and uh, if you have any doubts you can just feel free to message me on this number i am dr gayatri and my phone number is this okay you can feel free to uh, message me on this number and i'm i will i'm there to help you at any moment thank you so much
<coughs> Hello, uh, good evening. Yeah, yeah good evening. Uh, <coughs> we'll uh, now take a look at uh, continue with Shakespeare. Uh, please give me a minute. Right, we have to now uh, take a look at uh, Shakespeare's uh, uh, history plays. So what are Shakespeare's history plays, characteristics of Shakespearean history plays? So there are a few characteristics as we looked at yesterday about uh, Shakespeare's comedies. So Shakespeare's history plays uh, uh, th that prescribed for us are a few, Henry the Five Part Two, uh, Richard the Second and Richard the Third. So um, uh, Shakespeare's history plays deal with uh, uh, histories uh, you, especially with uh, roman histories um, and they deal with uh, especially with english history now um, there are uh, several uh, historical plays uh, for uh, to to shakespeare's credit there are uh, uh, eight plays which trace english monarchy from the 14th century um, to the to the tudor period uh, and uh, most of his uh, Shakespeare's history plays are set against the medieval English history. Uh, example, an example is Richard II. They are set against the backdrop, backdrop of medieval English history. So um, uh, Shakespeare in his historical plays dramatized the Hundred Years War with France, the famous Hundred Years War with France. Uh, and uh, there is no accurate description of uh, certain things historical in Shakespeare's play. And Shakespeare seems to have changed the facts according to his whims and fancies. There are lots of changes that he himself seemed to have done. And historical anachronism is one important thing that we find in his play. What is historical anachronism? Things that were not possible uh, uh, during uh, those times when the play takes place, but uh, things which were uh, which Shakespeare was aware of during his time, all the all of them have been used in the, those particular plays. For example, trial by combat was not uh, um, in vogue during that time, but that is being used in some of the historical plays. This is called historical anachronism. Um, the, the clock in Julius Caesar's uh, play is a historical anachronism. Uh, never underestimated, uh, he never underestimated the value of history in any of his historical plays. He set a very high uh, value for history. Uh, that's how historical plays become very famous. He wanted it to be a lesson to society. So Shakespeare's aim of uh, writing the historical plays was he wanted it to be a lesson to society. And uh, for example, Richard II uh, is, uh, is, a, is an example of how to rule and not to rule. It's an example to rulers. How to rule and not to rule. That's the lesson that one can take from Richard the Two. And Henry the Five is an example of uh, of patriotic zeal. What is patriotic zeal and how uh, is one to exhibit uh, one's patriotic zeal? That you find in Henry the Five. So these historical plays also depict social structures with hierarchies. Um, you find uh, Shakespeare bringing together the king and the beggar, the palace and the brothel house. Uh, the tragic and the comic elements of life and uh, some of his plays uh, uh, it is shakespeare's mastery as a great dramatist as a great playwright that makes possible the depiction of the king and the beggar at the same time not all can do that so his uh, a description of the uh, the his portrayal of the king is also at its best he can also portray the beggar at his best uh, and uh, the end of the uh, comedies, uh, as we saw yesterday, comedies usually uh, end in a happy reunion of friends, lovers, or a family. Uh, and the tragedy, of course, uh, ends in the uh, total uh, bloodbath and massacre. And uh, here, in historical plays, some of the historical plays end happily, while others end tragically. So this is uh, all about uh, his uh, historical plays, uh, the characteristic features of Shakespearean historical plays. And uh, when we come to Henry the Five, Part Two, prescribed for you, uh, it's nothing but a continuation of Henry the Five, uh, Henry the Four, Part One. 
so uh, you have the rebels the, the opening scene e explains the rebels and the king in war uh, the king is in constant conflict so henry the 4 is in constant conflict and this conflict is an internal as well as an external conflict the conflict conflict that he suffers is a constant one throughout his life it has an he he lives an inner turmoil about how he had uh, how he had acted in the past so at the same time his outer turmoil is also exhibited in many ways so uh, actually uh, henry the four had uh, um, joined hands with the rebels now he is the king but before that he had joined hands with the rebels and he had overthrown the then king richard the two and richard the two was killed because of this particular uh, uh, rebels and henry the uh, four acting together so henry the four was able to overthrow richard two and kill him along with the rebels one of the rebels is northumberland but now that he has become the king northumberland has once again joined hands with other rebels and is fighting against henry the four himself so this is the malady of henry the four now henry the four with two of his sons a useless hal hal is henry uh, uh, henry junior so henry the four has two sons hal uh, who is actually henry and the prince uh, john prince hal and prince john Prince Hal is a useless uh, fellow who hangs out with all petty criminals and uh, lives a life of uh, joy and uh, happiness, not of pleasure-filled life. But Prince John is uh, uh, tot totally different. He goes to war. In fact, Henry IV believes and uh, depends on uh, Prince uh, John uh, to take up uh, serious business. So Prince John is uh, ready for uh, ready for a truce. So this is what uh, this is the turning point. Prince John says um we i will uh, i will forgive if you submit yourself he tells that to the um, rebels uh, rebels headed by northumberland northumberland is a, was one of the rebels so uh, and uh, what happens is prince john in his um, uh, duel with uh, the rebels kills one hotspur the name of the person is hotspur but he arrests, arrests the rebels unethically and um, he brings them under control. Uh, this news is being conveyed to Henry IV. Henry IV is not doing well. This, uh, this um, news of success is conveyed to Prince, uh, uh, Prince John's success is conveyed to Henry IV. But uh, since because of his weak, um, uh, weak weakness, Henry the four swoons or he faints as soon as he hears this very joyous news on his bed. He is unwell. He is being cared for by his uh, uh, useless son, uh, Prince Hal. Prince Hal, who is nearby, uh, mistakes his father. Uh, uh, this, uh, this battle that Prince John wins is the Battle of Shrewsbury. The Battle of Shrewsbury is won by Prince John, Henry the fourth's son. As soon as the news arrives, Henry IV is very weak to even accept that news, so he faints. And Prince Hal, uh, the useless uh, son of uh, Henry IV, thinks his mistakes that his father is dead. So he takes the father's crown and puts it on his head, and uh, you know he enjoys that experience. So he crowns himself. The king suddenly opens his eyes, and he is shocked by uh, the action of his son, the useless uh, Prince Hal. Um, so he says to Prince Hal, uh, it is a horror that I have seen and uh, my mind will never forgive you. So in order to, uh, I want to be taken to the Holy Land, Jerusalem, before my death. To, and moreover, I am also feeling guilty about having killed Richard II along with uh, <coughs> uh, the ripples. So I want to go as a, uh, uh, to take, ask for forgiveness. So I want to be taken to the land of Holy Land of Jerusalem before my death. And he gives a long sermon in his deathbed to, uh, of course, he, stayed, he, he is ill. So even after his son comes, Prince uh, John comes, he gives a very long sermon uh, where he tells what is right and what is wrong. Of course, he has changed a new leaf. <coughs> Though he overthrew Richard II then, now he is a ruler. He, is, uh, he loves his country. He loves his citizens, wants to do the best for his citizens, wants to secure the, his uh, citizens. And so he gives a long sermon in his deathbed and finally dies. <coughs> dies. <coughs> uh, so Prince Hal uh, is now becomes Henry the uh, Five. He is uh, advised by uh, Lord uh, by the Lord Chief Justice 
to serve as a good king. So, but Prince Hal seems to be always in the company of many criminal men. The most famous character in uh, Shakespeare's uh, drama, Falstaff. Falstaff comes in this particular place. Falstaff is one of his friends. Falstaff is a former associate uh, and uh, thinks of the development. But once um, uh, Prince Hal, uh, the useless prince, becomes King Henry V, uh, Falstaff thinks he can take a lot of help from him. Okay, Falstaff is actually a useless criminal. Uh, with petty criminal activities all around the doing pretty, uh, petty criminal activities so he wants to uh, take help from the now king who is also his friend but uh, surprisingly prince hal uh, says false stuff should never be seen anywhere in the kingdom and he is being deported the play uh, and false stuff is disappointed but false stuff still remembers that the play ends with henry the five planning to invade france which is totally which is totally uh, not advisable, but uh, the Henry IV, that is Prince Hal, who is now Henry V, plans to invade France. The play ends with this. So uh, it is uh, full of the English uh, history. Uh, and so this is an example of a uh, historical play. And um, coming to... Um, in this particular play, what is important is the... Um, Henry the uh, King Henry the five uh, five's guilty feeling. He lives with his guilty feeling for having overthrown the former King Richard the two. So the uh, this entire kingdom was actually he had looted it from Richard two. So he is constantly uh, guilty with the feeling that he has uh, he had killed Richard two the former king. But uh, despite this uh, side of uh, a villainous uh, this villainy uh, in his uh, person. He is very. He's a very good king, very good administrator. That, uh, uh, that who is very loving to his uh, citizens. He wants to help his citizens. He wants his citizens to have a safe life. That's why he even sends his son, um, Prince uh, John, to uh, face the rebels. So this is an important aspect uh, of Henry the Fourth, and. Um, the other characters, especially Falstaff, is an example. And uh, Falstaff is one of the most memorable characters celebrated by audience all over the world. He stands taller among Shakespearean characters because of his presence in more than four plays. Uh, Falstaff is more dynamic, is most dynamic and human of Shakespeare's characters. Though he was, uh, he is a fat, cheerful, witty criminal. Uh, he is a close. Uh, he he is very close to Prince Hal, but uh, despite all that. Uh, Falstaff is very famous uh, uh, and is uh, found in many places. So Falstaff is one memorable character that we find in this in this play, Henry the Fourth, Part Two. Uh, moving on to um, Richard the Two. Uh, Richard the Two play is uh, the first of a tetralogy, four plays. Uh, Richard the Two is uh, uh, the first uh, play. Um, So Richard the uh, two starts with the, uh, is actually the uh, history of King Richard the two. Uh, so you have King Richard the two on one side and the three important characters Richard the two. Uh, you have Henry Bolingbroke who is the Duke of Hereford. Uh, you have Thomas Mowbray who is the Duke of Norfolk. So all three of them, Henry Bolingbroke and Thomas Mowbray are here. Um, and actually, there is a lot of accusation going on at the beginning of the play. Uh, the play accusing um, uh, Duke of Gloucester is dead, and uh, King Richard the two accuses uh, Thomas Mowbray, and another cousin accuses Henry Bolingbroke for the death of the Duke of Gloucester, and uh, he they are also being accused for uh, treason. But uh, in order to find out who is exactly. Uh, um, the reason for all these uh, behind all these crimes, Wallingbroke and Mowbray enter into a trial by combat, fight till a fight until death. So this trial by combat is a historical um, uh, historical anachronism that we find in Shakespeare's play. So trial by combat was not uh, was not in vogue during these times. But uh, Shakespeare just to add. Uh, add flavor to his uh, historical play and to a battle uh, give a battleground effect introduces trial by combat trial by combat is nothing but testing the truthfulness by fighting each other till death 
so um, when this uh, particular uh, trial is going on when they combat each other um, people uh, the, the king interferes and both of them are banished for life bolingbroke is banished for uh, uh, 10 years while mowbray duke of mowbray is banished for life mowbray has to leave the uh, uh, kingdom but bolingbroke's 10 year uh, uh, banishment is reduced to 6 Uh, six because uh, bolingbroke's father is the um, is john of gaunt john of gaunt has lot of wealth so uh, we have richard the two who has an eye on john of gaunt's wealth so he uh, trying to get into this uh, uh, into a friendly circ uh, into the friendly circles of john of gaunt uh, the king reduces bolingbroke's uh, banishment to six years so um while these things are happening uh, and uh, mowbray and bolingbroke are away richard uh, is at war with ireland actually uh, that is a wrong move richard the two should not be at war with ireland because already because of all these unnecessary wars and richard's mismanagement the economy of the kingdom is down and uh, forced uh, loans are being levied upon the citizens so because of the bad economical situation and forced loans the citizens are very happy and happy and also the misuse of king's right to tax the king usually actually has a right to tax so that is being levied upon the citizens so the citizens are very happy and happy and bitter with richard's administration and uh, uh, when bolingbroke is away john of gaunt falls ill and richard he is in his deathbed richard slowly uh, you know um, brews a, a villainous plan he plans to confiscate john of gaunt's property in his deathbed because with bolingbroke the duke of Bo uh, bolingbroke away uh, he thinks it is easy to take away uh, john of gaunt's uh, properties uh, but gaunt understands uh, richard's villainous plot and he wants give him gives him fair warning he says never do this it is uh, an error this will cost you a lot of loss but uh, bolingbroke's uh, property is being taken away soon after gaunt's death bolingbroke comes to know of uh, uh, richard's villainous activity uh, and richard is uh, richard is now after taking away the property richard is now focusing on capturing ireland uh, it's also a wrong move during which time bolingbroke comes back from his banishment of 6 years and invades richard's richard's kingdom itself so richard's kingdom itself comes under attack by bolingbroke bolingbroke tries tries to avenge his father's death and the property having been taken away from him in a very um, you know uh, uh, dishonest way so he invades uh, the kingdom and bolingbroke uh, surprisingly has the support of so many people so all people support bolingbroke bolingbroke because they are very unhappy with the misadministration uh, bad administration of richard and all of them support and bolingbroke takes charge of the city of the kingdom bolingbroke is crowned as henry the fourth so from richard the two uh, the 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 crown comes to henry the fourth um, and uh, richard is sent richard is captured but richard of course uh, tries to make peace which is uh, simply not possible and um, richard is uh, sent to the tower of london as a punishment uh, but uh, there is um, uh, sir exton So Sir Exton uh, is a confidant of uh, Bolingbroke. He has his own doubts about Richard and follows Richard uh, in order to kill him. But Bolingbroke is not happy with uh, Richard being killed. But uh, unfortunately, um, Sir Exton uh, kills Boling. Uh, sorry, kills uh, Henry the kills Richard when he is taken to the Tower of London. Um, Uh, and Henry the Fourth uh, promises to visit Holy Land and report, uh, repent for Richard the Two's death. So Henry the Fourth feels that he is responsible for the uh, murder of Richard the Two, and he uh, promises himself that he will visit the Holy Land, Jerusalem, and uh, ask for forgiveness for the uh, unfortunate death of Richard the Two, which uh, he, uh, his coronation has caused. So uh, based on all these things, there is. Um, Uh, we understand that richard is uh, um, king richard is shakespeare's anti hero so richard is a um, uh, richard is a king who never ruled himself but was ruled by greedy elements around him that's why he levied taxes made people made his soldiers collect taxes uh, and all that 
uh, he could not even solve the quarrel between Bolingbroke and Mowbray. So as an analysis of this play, we understand that uh, he was not able to bring peace between the uh, uh, quarrel of two lords. So when John of Gaunt, Bolingbroke's father, passes away, he cunningly plans to confiscate the estates. So this criminal aspect in uh, Richard II makes him a very incompetent ruler, an ambivalent ruler. Uh, it shows that he is very insecure and is a problematic hero of Shakespeare. Uh, like any other Shakespearean hero, it, it is a split personality that we find in Richard II. Richard II uh, uh, is a very good uh, uh, to his uh, citizens for some time, but then there is always this uh, um, his inability to come in the middle of um, a war, in his inaction, standing in the middle of the war, not trying to bring peace between two people who are part of his kingdom. Um, so, uh, of course, uh, he invites the uh, uh, wrath of Bolingbroke, who brings the do uh, brings uh, possible Richard's. Uh, End. Richard is killed mainly because, mainly because of his taking away the property of John of Gaunt and actually being dishonest to Bolingbroke. But he is a man of inconsistency in his actions and he falls a victim for his inconsistent acts. Uh, so Elizabethans believe that the uh, king is a demigod. So when the king does something wrong, then he has to fall down uh, from his place of glory and uh, the people are uh, actually uh, unhappy with him. And when towards the end he is his throne, scepter, and crown are all taken away. People are actually, uh, they are neither uh, happy nor unhappy, but they are agitated. They are very disturbed. So this is what happens in historical plays. Historical plays show you great kings, but great kings who have a lot of inabilities, incapacities, and those incapacities can cause a lot of disturbance in the middle of uh, ordinary citizens as well as those in the palace um, palaces also. So uh, this is another play that we have been looking at. Moving on to Roman play, plays, uh, what, is, what is a Roman play? A Roman play is nothing but having Rome as the background and uh, the Roman uh, elements as the background. So early Rome is portrayed in Roman plays. The plebeians have an important uh, place, in, important role to play in uh, Roman plays. And uh, we have three plays um, as examples of Roman plays. Once again, we have uh, we have uh, um, Coriolanus, Julius uh, Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra as uh, as the uh, Roman plays in this particular um, uh, prescribed text. Uh, one of them is uh, a story of one of them. One of them is actually a tragedy. One of them is a personal uh, is personal vengeance and one's loss. The other one is um, a, a story of love and uh, um, you know cheating. Um, and Coriolanus is a little different. So now, let, looking at uh, these things, in, when we come to Coriolanus, what do we see? Um, we have the protagonist, the patrician soldier, Caius Martius. So uh, Caius Martius is here. The monarchical rule is over the city of Rome. The elite merchants and aristocrats are called the patricians. They negotiate. Patricians are the are on the one side, and plebeians are on the other side, and they settle for due representation of the common people in Rome. Uh, Rome's governing body called a tribune. Uh, so the patrician soldier is Caius Martius. He says the plebeians who want common people to rule should not be given a place. He represents the patricians, the aristocrats, the elite uh, merchants. Uh, but he is totally different. He is hated for the common masses is uh, is very well known. Um, uh, so there is, uh, but Caius Martius uh, is not very famous because of this particular uh, um, um, personality that he exhibits. Uh, at this uh, juncture, uh, uh, the Walsicans, Walsians, who are an Italian tribe, they wage a war against the Rome, Romans under the leadership of uh, Tullus Ophidius. So Ophidius is the prime rival of uh, Caius Martius. Caius Martius is a Roman soldier. Uh, Ophidius is the uh, main rival. So Romans emerge victorious uh, mainly because of Caius Martius's bravery. So they also captured the Italian city of uh, um, Coriolis, where Ophidius gets defeated once again in the hands of Ma uh, Martius. So Martius is very happy. 
um, and uh, though the plebeians agree to give their votes for making Coriolanus the council, later they turn against him. So Coriolanus is not going to be elected uh, by his own. His his anger is a negative point, um, especially by two tribunes, namely Brutus and uh, Cicinius. So these two, because of the uh, two tribunes, Brutus and Cicinius, Coriolanus is not given the uh, role of the council uh, towards the end. Coriolanus is very angry by this turn of events which have gone against his favor and, see, and he speaks uh, very angrily against the plebeians. So Coriolanus joins with his uh, former enemy Ophidius. So these place, historical place, especially Coriolanus is nothing but uh, uh, grabbing the opportunity. So if you can say Coriolanus is opportunist, sometimes it does fit because Coriolanus was actually fighting with Ophidius and had, uh, and had beaten him down. But now when, uh, the, when the situation requires, he seems to join hands with Ophidius. He's watching an enemy and uh, planning to fight the plebeians. In the absence of Coriolanus, uh, to lead their army and having to fight against the Walsian force led by Coriolanus and Aphidius, Romans failed miserably in all their uh, in, in their advancements. So two old friends of Coriolanus are sent are sent to Coriolanus to make peace. So uh, the the Roman army is uh, unable to face the wrath and the strong army of Coriolanus along with Aphidius. Uh, so. Two friends are sent as emissaries to meet Coriolanus to fight, uh, to stop the war. Uh, but Coriolanus is not convinced to stop his actions of revenge against his country. So they fail. Finally, Coriolanus has, uh, learning that Coriolanus has deep respect and affection for his mother, Volumina, Volumnia, uh, she is being sent to meet Coriolanus and plead him to stop the war against Rome. So, uh, several emissaries, his friends and finally his mother is being sent to Coriolanus because Coriolanus is certainly a great warrior, uh, is, is, are being sent to make him stop the war. Coriolanus loves his mother so much, he has great respect for her. Uh, Volumnia is hailed as the savior of Romans when she is able to make Coriolanus stop the war. So, back at uh, Antium, the place Antium, Roman, uh, uh, Rome's Antium, Coriolanus is given a heroic welcome and the residents hail him as their hero. So he has agreed to stop the war just because of the word of his mother, because he has great respect for her. But already frustrated over the power uh, and respect he commands among his people, Ophidius is now feeling downgraded because uh, Ophidius uh, joined hands with him to uh, fight against Rome. But once again, people are uh, welcoming Coriolanus and not him. He declares that Coriolanus has committed treachery by not capturing Rome and yielding to the plea of his mother against the of Volscians. An argument ens ensues before, uh, between the two former enemies and some men loyal to Ophidius assassinate Coriolanus. So Coriolanus, who, has, who had finally given in to his mother's words, uh, is finally assassinated uh, by Ophidius' uh, men, uh, even though the entire um, country uh, appreciates that he is a great warrior. So this is the tragic story of Coriolanus. So in Coriolanus story, one thing we should remember is Coriolanus uh, uh, was a great warrior. Of course, uh, he is also an enraged noble, but uh, towards the end, we find that he has also a human side to it. He seems to have great respect, deep respect for his mother. He agrees to do what she wants. But uh, at the end, he is tragically killed, which becomes inevitable in some of the tragic plays of uh, Shakespeare. Uh, of course, this is a history, historical play, but uh, still the, a tragic end to a historical play is what we see in uh, this particular play. So next comes uh, Julius Caesar. Uh, the, when we analyze the plot, I think all of us must be familiar with Julius Caesar than you know, Coriolanus or any other play. So Julius Caesar, we have Caesar and the triumvirates. The triumvirates are the three soldiers, uh, Caesar's men. Uh, as, uh, this is a, a Roman play because uh, the action takes place in the streets of Rome. Caesar, um, uh, with his great nobles Brutus, Mark Antony, and Cassius. So these are the three, tri the triumvirates. They they are together: Brutus, Mark Antony, and Cassius. They have, and uh, when the play opens, you have uh, so many people, a uh, group of mob wandering in the streets of Rome. 
they have gathered to watch the victory parade of Julius Caesar. Julius, a lot of celebration is going on. At the same time, there is a soothsayer. So when we spoke of the tragedies, we had ghosts and we had witches who prophesied. They said something will happen, like uh, uh, the astrologers. They have a saying, they prophesy. Their prophecies turn out true. Similarly, here we have a soothsayer who wants uh, the mighty Julius Caesar to be aware of the Ides of March. The Ides of March is the middle of March. So uh, he wants Caesar, but Caesar doesn't seem to uh, you know, believe that. He, uh, he, he ignores the warning. Of course, there are other uh, warnings too. Uh, um, portents, they are called portents, P-O-R-T-E-N-T-S. The portents are owls screaming in the um, uh, daytime. It doesn't happen. So whenever it happens, they, po they foresee uh, something tragic is going to happen in that place. Um, and his wife, uh, Caesar's wife, sees uh, a man's uh, Caesar statue bleeding. Then she seems to see uh, men with uh, bloody hands. All of them she is able to see these portents, uh, portents and omens, bad omens, everyone sees. But uh, Julius Caesar doesn't seem to accept all this. So Julius Caesar's power and Julius Caesar's gallantry were kept on one side. The other side of Julius Caesar is Julius Caesar is a weakling. Julius Caesar suffers from epileptic fits. Julius Caesar is deaf in one year. So there are other negative qualities of Julius Caesar that are being camouflaged by his victories. And all his victories are caused by uh, his uh, great nobles, the warriors who surround uh, Julius Caesar. So uh, this is the background in which the action takes place. So uh, you have uh, uh, Cassius and Brutus who are very close uh, aides of Caesar and uh, friends with each other. Um, they, they are all now conspiring against Julius Caesar. They want to kill Julius Caesar and uh, usurp the throne. Um, and uh, what they do is, Brutus is a very honest friend of Caesar and uh, ma um, Cassius, in a very cunning way, he talks to Brutus uh, and uh, makes sure that Brutus is disturbed by his words uh, and plots to involve Brutus in a conspiracy against Caesar. He places many forged letters at Brutus's home. How do they turn Brutus's mind? Seeming, seemingly written by Roman citizens about the uh, audacious behavior of Julius Caesar. So um, they, they actually tarnish the name of Julius Caesar. Brutus will not believe anybody when it comes to Julius Caesar. So when it, if they are words from Roman citizens, if they are letters from Roman citizens placed inside the house and uh, you know so that Brutus is able to take them and read them, then Brutus will slowly begin because Brutus has the uh, the, the Roman citizens uh, first in his priority list, uh, even before the king, his, uh, his uh, Julius Caesar. So Cassius makes sure that Brutus first forms a very bad impression of Caesar. And they are able to do it with the help, uh, in cunningly with the help of placing letters and uh, uh, distressed people. So Brutus believes that there are many uh, sad people who are sad with, who are unhappy with uh, um, Julius Caesar's uh, ruling of Rome. And so when Cassius very cunningly talks to him against Julius Caesar, Brutus believes it and Brutus believes that it is right to kill Julius Caesar as Cassius says. Of course, Mark Antony is the most honest warrior. He's a great warrior. He's a great orator too. So uh, they are not able to include Mark Antony. And uh, with the help of uh, uh, Brutus and his uh, uh, nameness, Cassius plots to kill Caesar. And the conspirators decide to leave Antony and take out Caesar to the Senate and murder him there. So they are able to do it uh, successfully. Um, Antony... By, by the time they murder Caesar, Antony returns and pretends to be allying with the conspirators. Antony has his own doubts when he hears of uh, Julius Caesar's uh, death. He understands that there, is, there has been some conspirators and there has been some plot going on uh, to kill uh, Caesar, Caesar. When he insists Brutus and other conspirators to disclose the reason for murdering Caesar, Brutus tells him that they will state the reasons apparently during Caesar's funeral. And uh, the one uh, wrong move that he does is he allows uh, Antony, Mark Antony, to deliver a speech on the occasion of the funeral of uh, Caesar. But Cassius is very unhappy because Cassius knows that Antony is suspicious. And Cassius also knows that Antony is a great orator 
and through his oratorial power he can change the citizens very quickly uh, but very strongly against themselves against them uh, and that is what exactly happens towards the end of the play so towards the end of the play you have antony giving the best speech uh, uh, in uh, shakespeare's uh, uh, the best speech in shakespeare's plays uh, you can find so he says friends uh, romans and countrymen so he starts this uh, great speech where slowly but steadily he makes sure that the citizens understand what has actually happened in his oratory he very clearly but very insistently tells how uh, caesar was murdered by a group of conspirators for the wrong reasons so the people uh, who are naive seems to slowly understand what mark antony is trying to tell them and they accept the fact that mark antony has uh, now divulged the truth so they understand that uh, um, cassius and uh, brutus are uh, the reason for julius caesar's murder and their anger turns to julius uh, turns to brutus and uh, cassius while brutus and cassius were able to portray julius caesar in a bad life light in front of the citizens uh, mark antony through his oratorial powers has made the citizens understand that julius caesar was not wrong but julius caesar was uh, cunningly manipulatively killed by um, the others <coughs> uh, in the senate so antony privately avouched to avenge caesar's murder uh, brutus delivers an elaborate talk at the forum and uh, followed by antony antony delivers a more powerful and sarcastic oration so he tells that what was how was his speech about his speech says he tells that caesar brought wealth and glory to rome for which he has been killed he then reads the will of caesar caesar's dying will final will in which caesar has allotted a share of his money to every citizen and has made uh, his uh, private garden open to public use so the citizens uh, gradually realize the noble deeds of caesar and uh, the mob chase brutus cassius and other conspirators away so meanwhile um, there are other uh, 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 soldiers uh, octavius lepidus and antony they are all soldiers form a three person coalition to fight out the conspirators who are raising armies outside the city so there comes a time when the war uh, uh, begins after the generals uh, exchange words of insult against each other cassius's armies flee unable to withstand the attack of uh, uh, antony um, antony and the others uh, lepidus and the others uh, so from a distance cassius's man notices titinius surrounded by his cheering troops but mistakes him to be encircled by the enemies on getting the mistaken information of his best friend titinius's flight cassius asks his men to kill him and uh, he dies saying that caesar has been avenged brutus learns of the death of uh, cassius and titinius and his army loses to the romans again uh, brutus also dies by impaling upon his sword because um, uh, brutus understands that he has be he has been he has mistaken or he has not seen through the manipulation of uh, um cassius so uh, uh, see brutus's death is also very brutal he dies by impaling upon his own sword and dies saying that caesar can now rest in peace because uh, he had he has killed himself octavius and antony mark antony lament for the death of brutus because brutus was brutus was a very honest simple person who was also a great soldier and he is given an honorable burial uh, fitting to his noble intentions though he did, did not really uh, mean anything wrong so the rise and fall of great warriors of course like coriolanus you also have lot of uh, 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 bloodied uh, scenario at the end of julius caesar but julius caesar is a story of conspiracy conspiracy of the best men around him uh, which led to the death of julius caesar of course all of shakespeare's uh, 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 dramatic elements like uh, the soothsayer saying the portents that appear in the morning um, in the city of rome uh, and then uh, a long lengthy oratory uh, which uh, even the war, even a fight a sword is not able to get the things done get justice done whereas mark antony's able speech able orate, oration uh bring makes possible the uh, you know the finalizing of justice so justice is being meted out only through mark antony's speech 
and in the case of brutus it is actually tragic because brutus very slowly but very in a, uh, but very uh, but understands that uh, he has uh, taken the wrong path after a very long time so it is very late so his uh, his understanding comes uh, revelation comes but it is very late and so he is unfortunately um, he unfortunately meets his death uh, he kills himself it is a suicide by impaling himself on his own sword um, the sword of a great soldier so brutus's honest intentions are very clear and so he is given the right burial that a soldier um, it, uh, uh, you know that fits a soldier so once again these roman plays uh, set in the rome uh, background of rome but uh, with a lot of uh, Uh, Antony uh, rightly uh, uh, right for an historical play. Antony rightly remarks at the end that he is the noblest of all uh, Romans, um, and he says, uh, being a historical play, Julius Caesar has uh, um, there is no compl there are no complex characters as in the other great tragedies because it's a historical play. Uh, Brutus stands out as the complex character in the play. So when Brutus actually dies in the end, uh, most readers feel a kind of pity. Uh, for brutus brutus has actually been wrong whose internal conflicts and emotional sufferings make him a tragic figure at the end coriolanus also has lot of conflicts uh, a great uh, soldier but he is not able to control his anger and his emotions so he wrongs so uh, that was the tragic end of coriolanus similarly we find a tragic end in brutus uh, he reveals his tarnished mind in the soliloquy he has a lot of conflicts he often talks to himself soliloquies soliloquies are speeches that he gives to himself uh, which offer an insight into his good goodness his virtues as well as his follies so macbeth also uh, in his tragedy he does a lot of soliloquies so in this way this is another one very effective uh, um, uh, roman play and uh, then we have uh, antony and cleopatra in antony and cleopatra of course the famous uh, love story of antony and cleopatra this roman play uh, stands um, as uh, uh, primarily a love story so um, so shakespeare's uh, uh, this play is set in roman landscape and to make the audience feel that they are exposed to the geographical setup of a roman empire the seas by the roman coast uh, the the places of uh, importance in rome um, in those days is rome all of them are being recorded in this particular play by doing so shakespeare has tried to introduce the geographical and cultural backdrop of roman landscape that's why these plays are called roman plays uh, so the background of the play is uh, well constructed Uh, history of the characters like three important characters octavius caesar uh, mark antony and cleopatra octavius caesar's uh, uh, sister um, uh, is given in marriage to mark antony mark antony is octavius caesar's best uh, friend uh, the the a uh, very honest daring soldier cleopatra i think all of us agree is the egyptian beauty par uh, excellence Uh, in fact the play revolves around these three main characters and give the picture of the revered roman empire um and uh, uh, when we look at the plot uh, uh, mark antony in the beginning of the play idly spends his time in egypt and has affairs with the country's most beautiful queen cleopatra so egyptian queen cleopatra uh, is uh, is very beautiful that mark antony is unable to uh, re resist his attraction for her and he has an affair with her he decides to leave egypt after getting the message his wife is fulvia fulvia is uh, octavia uh, um uh, his his wife first wife is fulvia and she uh, passes away uh, and uh, mark antony is now in the hands of cleopatra uh, so um in the absence of antony his other the other two rulers octavius caesar and lepidus are uh, afraid of pompey's development um in occupying the roman empire they want antony back because antony is one of the best soldiers so caesar is unhappy that antony is uh, always lost in egypt in the hands of cleopatra so he plans to marry his sister uh, octavia octavia caesar's sister is octavia to antony thinking that the marriage will make antony not go anywhere else but all said and done uh, antony uh, in a way antony is unable to uh, resist her uh, beauty her attraction octavia is in, is often distressed because of the rising conflict between her brother and husband 
because uh, uh, her brother wants uh, uh, Mark Antony, Octavius Caesar wants Mark Antony around uh, the city of uh, Rome, whereas Antony quite often is found in Egypt in the hands of Cleopatra. She pleads to Antony to maintain a peaceful relationship with her brother Octavius Caesar. But uh, he quite often rushes to Egypt and surrenders uh, to the charming beauty of Cleopatra. He raises a large army against Caesar himself at Egypt and plans to put an end to his misdeeds. Uh, Caesar is in turn enraged over uh, the way Antony treats his sister Os Octavia uh, and she is actually sent to Rome all alone just, to be, uh, ju just so that uh, uh, Antony can go back to Cleopatra. Caesar commands his uh, army and navy to Egypt against Antony and his aide Cleopatra but Antony takes to, uh, decides to take on Caesar's army in the sea where the Roman military is very powerful. So uh, they are not, um, so they have this uh, fight, but Antony wouldn't leave Cleopatra for anything in the world. So <laughs> towards the end of the play, Antony, uh, uh, of course, many activities of Cleopatra are against, are actually very, uh, they fail Antony in his confidence that Antony at one point condemns Cleopatra for having treated him deep into defeat in the, through her foolish activity, acts of cowardly retreat. Uh, but uh, Cleopatra immediately begs for freedom as usual. Caesar uh, promises Cleopatra to consider uh, her plea and deliver a fair justice in her favor. But towards the end, Antony is given, a, 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 no, uh, Octavius is not able to uh, control Antony's uh, love for uh, um, um, Cleopatra. So he uh, sends, uh, and also he wants to safeguard his uh, sister. So he sends a, um, a message uh, telling that Cleopatra is no more. And uh, Antony is uh, so uh, disappointed that uh, Cleopatra is no more and uh, traumatized, he commits suicide soon uh, after uh, this news uh, reaches him. So um, on hearing that Antony uh, has killed himself because of, uh, and Caesar, Octavius Caesar also now demands that Cleopatra come to his kingdom and uh, serve him. So Cleopatra, who is truly in love with uh, him, um, um, uh, truly, truly in love with uh, Antony, refuses to go to uh, Octavius Caesar. She understands that Antony has uh, killed himself because of uh, Octavius Caesar's, um, you know, false information that she has committed suicide. Uh, so this misunderstanding, which is very uh, is uh, an important feature of Shakespearean tragedies, uh, Cleopatra decides to come end her life. Uh, by not by becoming a prisoner in Rome under Octavius Caesar, but she makes several poisonous snakes bite her and she dies. She uses small, very poisonous snakes called asps, ASP. Uh, so asps and uh, they bite her and she dies uh, a very painful death. After briefly mourning for her death, Caesar orders her to be buried beside Antony. Caesar seems to have accepted or uh, respect, uh, come to respect the love that they had for each other. And so they orders that uh, Cleopatra be buried next to Antony, uh, Antony's burial site. So uh, this is once again um, a Roman play which ends in uh, tragedy and we find that all the characters have, uh, all the characters uh, seem to have a kind of uh, uh, strong personalities which are quite often the hallmark of uh, Shakespeare's Roman plays and historical plays. And uh, moving on to Shakespeare's uh, sonnets. So what I uh, would uh, now do is, uh, how, 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 what are the salient features of Shakespeare's uh, sonnets? Um, so so sonnets refer to a 14 line poem. We move on to Shakespeare's sonnets. I uh, will quickly uh, you know, conclude this. Uh, Shakespeare's sonnets refer to a 14 line lyric poem written in iambic pentameter. So iambic pentameter is the um, uh, scheme used with a complex rhyme scheme. Uh, the word sonnet traces its roots to the Italian word sonetto. It means little song or song. Sonnets are generally grouped into Petrarchan sonnets or Shakespearean sonnets. So sonnet, 14 line poem, a lyrical poem with iambic pentameter and complex rhyme scheme. So uh, Shakespeare's uh, sonnets uh, were written when uh, the theatres shut down because of a plague in uh, England in the early 1590s. So during this period, Shakespeare's sonnets were circulated among his close associates uh, and uh, his sonnets uh, quite often refer to 
uh, he Shakespeare has written 154 sonnets in total. They are not numbered according to the chronology, uh, but they are grouped into three. Sonnets 1 to 26 are addressed to a young man. Sonnets 127 to 152 are directed towards a dark lady. And sonnets 152 to 154 are modeled on Greek poems. So this dark lady, we are not very sure who this dark lady is. We are not sure who this young man is. The young man could have been Shakespeare's lover. The dark lady could have been his sister or his uh, lady love. Uh, we are not sure. This has always been a matter of controversy when it comes to Shakespeare's uh, sonnets. One cannot be sure if these sonnets are autobiographical. Sometimes they say these sonnets are autobiographical. They have been written for um, uh, the, uh, his love interest. But uh, they are... Uh, of course, there are no proofs for that too. Uh, and generally, the 14 lines of sonnets are composed in iambic pentameter. Uh, first, three quatrains and a couplet. Uh, three quatrains uh, and a couplet. Couplet, two lines. Three quatrains means four lines of three stanzas. Uh, not all of his sonnets adhere to this form. Of course, there are uh, exceptions to it. So, these sonnets are uh, very important when you find that they follow the iambic pentameter. And uh, usually, the, um, the subject matter of these uh, sonnets is uh, love. And uh, uh, the most common symbols in Shakespeare, he uses a lot of symbols. Sonnets, uh, Shakespeare sonnets, uh, the symbols used quite often are flowers and trees, stars and weather and seasons. And uh, pathetic fallacy is a technique uh, employed by Shakespeare to bring out the effect where human emotions are attributed to inanimate objects or elements of nature. The, the cloud or the seasons take up human emotions. This is called a pathetic fallacy. A flower takes up a human emotion of love or sorrow. That's called pathetic fallacy. Shakespeare excelled in this particular art in his sonnets. So this is all about the stylistic aspect of his sonnets. And um, I think uh, with this, uh, we can, uh, this is all in a quick way. Uh, all about his uh, works, Shakespeare's uh, works. Uh, of course, we have looked at sonnets also, his Roman plays, his historical plays, of course, comedy and tragedy we did look at in the previous classes. So uh, with this, I come to the end of uh, my lecture session. Um, and uh, so maybe I should say all the best for your examinations. So this is where I conclude my lecture. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.